gotta try it. <laughs> it's part of my job. They tell me. That's how they train me. So look at your guys' work. It's weird for me to understand uh, what uh, integration does for us. I don't us. want to integrate. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. We do need to get it. I'm glad I picked this one up. Work with. Set that up. Ready to scrub in. Do some work. Justin, you didn't send it. I'm doing it. I mean, I should be going through. Like you clicked send already? Yeah. I keep refreshing. You have the right email address, man. Last time I looked at your thing, it said like it had a wrong letter or something. You spelling my name right? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the Zoom. Yeah. What What does that mean? You're looking like at your name on Zoom. Your name on Zoom. Read the email address that you sent the quiz to, letter by letter. Um, J, A S O N, underscore G I O R D A N O at nobl.k12.in.us. <sighs> okay, well, I'll keep looking. All right. Oh, it's loading. No, nothing came through. Okay, so what's going to happen? Pretty much most classes, we're going to start with free response warm-ups. And for a lot of students, they are intimidating. Because this is half of a free response. I mean, I could have given you all four parts. And eventually we're going to get there. Or I could have had you do part C and part D. But I don't want to, I want to kind of release these types of problems slowly to you guys. My hope is that you don't get frustrated, number one, because they can be confusing. I mean, honestly, every year, if you look up the averages on free response questions, like the high, these are always out of nine. Every free response is out of nine. And the highest averages are a problem might get four out of nine. Like that's the highest a problem will ever get across the country is four out of nine. Typically they're like 2.8, 2.9 out of nine. Those are the averages, okay? That's not to scare you, but that's to let you guys understand that just because you're struggling with these and you will, doesn't mean you don't know anything. I don't want you to feel that way. We're doing these so that, okay, your goal before the AP test, so by when's the AP test? The AP test is May 4th. Your goal before that day is to be able to get six out of nine points on average. A six out of nine is a five on the AP test. That's a 67% and that's a five. Even if you get five out of nine, that's a four on the AP test. And that's still your Calc 1 credit in college. That's your math credit, getting five out of nine. Right now, I would be happy when we start doing these FRQs I'd be happy if you're between a three and a four. You're in good shape because each time we go over one, if you could just find somewhere where like the next time you did a problem like this, you could get one more point better, then you're in awesome shape. That's how you got to go into these problems. You're going into them. Try to take my advice when I talk through them. That, that's kind of the biggest advice I can give you. When I'm giving you tips, make sure you're listening to those tips. So I look at A, all right? This whole problem, there's a lot going on. And I think a lot of students struggle with FRQs, not because of the calculus, but honestly, because of the reading. There's so many words and so many gross looking math things in that problem that it just kind of, your brain just starts to scramble. 
for a lot of students. You're never going to come across a problem that you don't know how to do, that you haven't been taught the skills to do the problem. Okay, so make sure you keep that in mind. Just always think back, like, what have I learned to solve this problem? So I go into this problem and they tell me the rate at which water is flowing into a pipe. Okay, they give me the rate. Then they tell me the rate at which water is also draining from the pipe. And I talked about this the other day. This is called a rate in, rate out problem, where there's something going in to something. And at the same time, there's something leaving. That same thing is leaving at the same time. So imagine that this is the pipe right here, right? And there's, there's water going in. And at the same time, there's water draining out, but at different rates. And so at any point in time, the water level could be going up or it could be going down depending upon is the water going in faster than it's draining or is it draining faster than it's going in? But that's kind of the whole point of the problem. So I look at A and A says, how many cubic feet of rainwater flow into the pipe during the eight hour time interval zero to eight? Anytime you guys see a rate of something, you're probably going to be integrating. It's so important to understand that when you integrate the rate of something, you figure out how much the original function changed. So to show you the answer for this, if you integrate the rate at which water goes into the pipe from zero to eight, you just found how much water went into the pipe from zero to eight. And it's important to understand two things. Number one, this question has nothing to do with, with water draining out of the pipe. It's not talking about that. It's just saying there's rainwater flowing into a pipe how much went in from zero to eight, that's it. And if you integrate the rate at which water went in from zero to eight, you get your answer. When you guys take your AP test on the FRQs, they're gonna give you all this space, all this blank space. Don't feel the need that you have to fill it up. This would get you your full credit. You don't, and I've mentioned this, if they name a function, you don't even need to put that function inside the integral. Just put the name of it right here. This is 100% credit right here. Okay, so over that eight hours, 76.570 cubic feet of rainwater went into that pipe. Yeah. Because the reason they didn't include units is because in the question, they've already basically told you the units. It's kind of like the way I always think about it is imagine having a conversation. Like you're talking to your friend and you're like, hey friend, how many cubic feet of rainwater went into that drain pipe from zero to eight? And your friend's like, oh, 13.4. Like you've already put the units on there. Does that make sense? I would always put the units on just in case. I've been told the only time units will ever be worth a point is if the problem says indicate units a measure because it does oftentimes. But I would always put it on just to be safe. The only time I wouldn't put units on is if there are no units given. With, with a lot of particle motion problems, they don't give units. So I wouldn't put them on then because if you if it doesn't say indicate units of measure and you put the wrong units on, you won't lose credit. Like if the units aren't worth anything, and even if you put the wrong ones, you're still safe. So I would always put it on to be safe. All right. So this is super important to understand what integration does for us. This is the giant concept of this entire chapter. We've been in school now for a month, second semester, and this is the big thing that if you've learned nothing else, you know, if you integrate the rate of something, you figure out how much the original thing happened. Okay. Now, B is the whole thing about the water level increasing and decreasing. It says, is the water going up or down at three hours? Because at any different point in time, the water level could be going or it could be going. And so we got to figure out the rate at which water is going in at three then figure out the rate at which water is leaving at three, and then compare those rates. There is no integration involved on B. So you need to find, I, I would answer this question a little differently than the rubric does, to be honest. Like if it was me doing this problem, I would write R of three equals blank, D of three equals blank. And then I would say, since D of three is less than R of three, the amount of water in the pipe is decreasing or greater than, I think I said that wrong. But that's what I would do. I would put those values and then compare those two values to answer the question. So <clears throat> these are very common questions. Now, I'm going to give you just a little tip. When you guys have your calculator and you're doing these FRQs, as soon as you guys see 
messy looking functions in the problem, as soon as you see that, I would immediately go to y equals and I would put those functions into y1 and y2 for several different reasons. Number one, once you type them in there, you never have to type them again. You're probably going to be using those functions throughout all four parts of the problem. And this is going to save you a ton of time. Let me show you how it saves you a ton of time. Because now, okay, if I want to integrate either one of these functions, or if I want to differentiate either one of these functions, I do want to, some of you guys already know this, but I want to do this. So if I do math nine, and I'm going to integrate R of T, which I put in as Y1. Well, I do from zero to eight. Now, instead of typing in the 20 sine of T squared over 35, which honestly, guys, this is a pretty innocent looking function compared to some that I've seen on the AP test. This is pretty simple looking. So instead of typing it in, if I want to just recall Y1 right here, if you push alpha trace, alpha trace, it, it lets you select your values and then just do it with respect to X. And that gets you your answer that way. So once you type them into Y1 and Y2, you could just recall them the whole time. And then also, like for part B, when I needed the, the function values, if you now go to your table and enter three, well, I get my function values right there. R of three is 5.0864 and D of three is 5.4. I didn't have to like plug three in. I, I already had them plugged in there. So it's a huge time saver. The only downside I've ever run into, I had a couple of students that they entered their function in the calculator wrong. And then they use that throughout all four parts. Now, I read with that student, meaning I figured out his mistake as I was grading, like what he did when he misentered it. And then I graded the rest of his problems accordingly. So he only missed one point. Um, and they do that a lot of times as AP graders too. So it, it's not as killer is what you would think. Are there any questions on, on this? Did, any, did anybody for A incorporate the 30 that was in there to begin with? Okay, good. So what I have students run into is this. Sometimes, you know, if they just say how much water went in, it doesn't matter how much water was in there to begin with. That's important to understand. There could have been a billion gallons or cubic feet of water in there to begin with, but that doesn't matter. But sometimes they'll say, how much cubic feet of water is in the pipe at T equals two? Like they'll ask how much is in there right now. And now you need to incorporate that beginning amount. You seem to be careful when that number matters and when it doesn't. All right. Someone was saying something. Does someone have a question? Can you show the second part? Yes, like nothing would please me more. You are welcome. But these are very common questions, rate in, rate out questions. And we'll, we're going to practice several more of them throughout the, throughout the semester. OK, <clears throat> so jump to the notes. We're going to go to the notes. You ready, Sydney? You ready? Yeah. Woo! All right, I'm excited. I haven't done anything today. I block one. Happy birthday, Sydney. Huh? Oh, there it is. Let me make sure the pictures came through clearly. This is the longest it has ever taken to get a quiz from someone. I don't, I don't even says, know what the issue is. It says can't display the image. What are you doing, man? Why? It's not coming through it's as a PNG. JPEG. It's coming through as a PNG. What the heck is a PNG? It's a PNG. Is that the same thing? It's a screenshot picture. It's a screenshot. He tried and it said corrupted. I don't I've never had this issue. I don't know. You guys all do it correctly. I don't know, Justin. This is a scam. Can you can you do this? Can you print it and bring it on Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, it does work. All right. I feel bad for you. I don't know what's happening. It's fine. I don't either. Right. He did, and it said corrupted. And then he emailed me a PDF, and it said corrupted. And then he sent pictures, and they won't open. So he's tried all the normal things. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it would say corrupted. Like, that just seems like a weird word. 
like you're sending a virus or something. I don't, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so today's lesson, I want to preface by bringing back what we learned about Riemann sums. All right. We learned how to estimate or approximate the area under a curve. You don't have to write what I'm about to be showing you guys. I just want to explain what we're going to be doing. So if I gave a curve before we ever learned how to actually integrate and find the actual area, we plugged in rectangles. We found the area of those rectangles and added them up and said, eh, that's our approximation. And then the more rectangles we put in, the better our approximation got. And that's what definite integration is. I don't know if you guys actually understand that, but definite integration is basically filling in infinitely many rectangles under that area and adding them all up. That's, that's what your calculator is doing when you do math nine. It's actually calculating the area of, I don't even know how many rectangles, but tons and tons and tons really quickly to get that answer. Well, the problem with rectangles is this. If I put rectangles under here, so there's one, and then there's another one. And let's say I put one more in there. And if I say, okay, that's my approximation. If I find the area of those three rectangles, that's the area under the curve. I found it. But that's poopy because we're missing all this, we're missing all this, and then we're missing this. Like that's a terrible approximation. And that's because rectangles don't fit well under curved spaces. So this is a Riemann sum. We've done this, but there is a shape that works better under curved areas. And that's what we're doing today. Today is all about putting trapezoids in there instead of rectangles. And let me show you why that is. If I have that same curved space like this, and I put a trapezoid in there, look at what happens. Well, if I go up, and then instead of going straight over and then down, well, if I angle it up like there and then down, there's a trapezoid. Look how pretty that is. That's just one trapezoid and I'm only missing this little bitty sliver right there. It's so much nicer to do a trapezoidal approximation than it is a Riemann sum. And then if I did another trapezoid, I go up, draw another trapezoid and then down and then one more. Look at this. Aiden, can you believe this? Oh, I really can. I know. That's only three trapezoids. And we pretty much have the area under that curve. We're just missing this little stuff right here. That's insane. If you can't understand the insanity, then just leave. <laughs> so what we are going to do today, instead of putting in rectangles, we're going to put in trapezoids. And then the question comes up every year. Usually there's a student. Time. There's usually a student that raises their hand and says, well, if trapezoids do a better job, why do we ever do this to begin with? Like, why do we do that if it's stupid? Well, the reason that you do need to know Riemann sums and the reason rectangles get used is because that's where definite integration comes from. Definite integration stems from adding up length times width of rectangles. And so that's why we have to be able to do it. But when you're doing an approximation, it really is so much better to do a trapezoidal approximation, okay? Now, when you go into a problem, they're gonna tell you which approximation to use. They're either gonna say, like they did on the quiz, they're either gonna say, do a left Riemann sum of four sub intervals. If you see the word Riemann, you're doing rectangles, like you've been doing all along. But the other question they can ask, I'll show you on the notes, we're gonna practice here. Here's an FRQ down here at the bottom that we're about to practice here in a minute. It says right here, use a trapezoidal sum with four sub intervals. So they're either going to use the word Riemann or they're going to say do a trapezoidal sum or a trapezoidal approximation. They're telling you which figure you're using. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's kind of practice this. We want to estimate the area under this curve from zero to four using a trapezoidal approximation of four sub intervals of equal width. But before we do that, Mr. Walker, can you tell me the area formula of a trapezoid? Because that's really the only thing we have to know today. Um, is it half of A plus B times the height? What is A and B? The top length and bottom length. So the parallel sides, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, our, the only formula that we need to know for trapezoids is it's one half times the height times the sum of the bases. 
the bases being the two parallel sides of the trapezoid. That's our formula for trapezoid. That's one now you have to know. You have to have memorized. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is sketch a graph of this. This is not something you would need to know what the graph looks like. So I'm going to just show you this. So the graph of this is actually a quarter circle in quadrant one. So it has a radius of four. So it's going to go up to four and it's going to go out to four. And it's like a quarter circle. This is not something you would need to know. But what we're going to do is fit in four trapezoids in here, find the area of each one of them, and then add them up. That's going to be our approximation. That's what we're going to be doing. Then there's a few nice things with trapezoids. Number one, it fits under the curve better. I showed you guys that, the insanity. But number two, the other nice thing is there is no difference between a right trapezoidal sum and a left trapezoidal sum. Like you get the same trapezoids regardless of where you start. With Riemanns, it matters if you start at the left endpoint versus the right endpoint when you're doing rectangles. With trapezoids, it doesn't matter. And so they'll never use the word. They'll just say, do a trapezoidal sum or a trapezoidal approximation. So that's the other nice thing, one less thing to keep track of. So I'm gonna start on the left here. I'm gonna go up till I hit the curve. But now, instead of going straight over to the right, I'm gonna angle my trapezoid down till, and hit the curve at the, when the next sub interval should be. And that should be at one. We should be hit the curve at one because that's when our next interval would happen. So I'm gonna angle till I get to one and then go down. And there's my first trapezoid. Look how nice that looks. Man, just so beautiful. And now I'm gonna find the area of that trapezoid. Okay, so we need to be very careful here and let me explain why. The area is gonna be one half. The height, Emily Wood, what is the height of this trapezoid? One. One? It's one. Yesterday I asked, um, you guys know Cole Kimmel? I asked Cole, I said, Cole, what's the height of this trapezoid? Cole, Cole's sitting there, he goes four. He said the height's four. And then he's staring at him where he goes, no, 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 no. He said, it's, it's twisted. The trapezoid's twisted, it's rotated. And it is, it's important to understand this. The height of a trapezoid is different than the height of rectangles. The height of a trapezoid is the distance between the two parallel sides. Our parallel sides are these vertical bars. These are the bases. Like in the formula, when it's base one and base two, that's what the two vertical segments are. So our height is actually the difference in our X values. Like those intervals, that's what the heights of these trapezoids are. That's probably the one thing that students struggle with with trapezoids. But imagine I rotate this to kind of make that a little more visually understood. I am a terrible artist, but imagine I take this trapezoid and I rotate it 90 degrees, okay? Well, then that trapezoid is gonna look like this. Oh my gosh. That's just so bad in so many ways, but that's what that trapezoid is gonna be if you rotate it 90 degrees. And so now you can see the height is what this is right here. It's that, it's that vertical part right there. So for that first trapezoid, it's one half times the height, which is one times the sum of the bases. Well, this is just where we need to be careful. So the bases, the first one is four. And the second one is whatever we get when we plug one in for X. Like it's whatever the Y value of that function is when X is one. So if you, and I'll tell you this value. If I plug one in for X, we get square root of 15. I don't know what the square root of 15 is. I have it here, 3.873. So that's the area of that first trapezoid. And then I got to do three more trapezoids. So I start at one, I go up, and I'm going to angle it down until I get to two, and then go down. You're not going to have to do this, like with the picture. I'm just trying to give you guys a visual of what's happening. So again, the second one's going to be one half. The height is again one, it's the difference in our x values. And now our bases are whatever these two y values are. We already found what f of one is, the y value there is 3.873. And then the second one is whatever we get when we plug two in for x. So whatever the square root of 12 is, I got written here, I'm a cheater. 
3.4641. And then we do another. So one half the height and then the bases are whatever F of two and F of three are. So 3.4641. And 2.6458. And then the last one. So the last one is actually really interesting because when you go up and then you angle it down so you hit the curve at four, you actually don't get a trapezoid, you get a triangle. But you can still use the trapezoid formula. It's just the second base is zero. Like, the, you have B1 plus B2, the B2 is just zero. So it still works. Isn't that interesting? The trapezoid area formula works for triangles. Does that make math more exciting, knowing that? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, see? All right. So one half times one times 2.6458 plus zero. And I've mentioned this and, I, and I've been fully serious. I would leave this answer. This was an FRQ. I, I wouldn't get my calculator out and add those things up. What are you just wasting time? So I would leave that. I don't know what that answer is. So you're probably never going, when you do a trapezoidal approximation or even a Riemann approximation, almost always it's going to happen when they give you a table of values. And so I wanted to practice one and given a table of values because honestly, if you know the actual function, like in example one, why wouldn't you just push math nine and get the exact answer? Like why get an approximation? The only time approximations are really used is when you are given like discrete data points and you don't actually know the function. So that this is when you're gonna be doing these approximations. So I wanna estimate the integral of F from zero to eight using a trapezoidal approximation of four sub intervals. Oh, take out the equal with part. That's not true. How did my yesterday's class not correct that? You guys have noticed that? No, totally. Yeah. Maybe they, they probably all did, just didn't say anything. That's my guess. Okay. So I basically need to find the area of four trapezoids and add them up. When I was grading the quizzes uh, that on the Riemann sum problem, I saw a lot of people like sketching little graphs and drawing rectangles. And if that's what you need to do visually to like do these table problems, then do it. I'm not going to steer you away from that. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. But I do want to show you that, and even with trapezoids, you don't have to sketch that graph. So here's what's going to happen. It's for the first trapezoid, it's going to be one half. The height is always going to be the difference in the x interval, or in this case, t interval. So my first height is going to be two, the difference from zero to two. That's the height, the difference in the x's. My base is are going to be the y values at those two locations. Like in here, it was the y value at zero and at one. Here's the y value at zero and at two. So these are my B1 and B2 values for that first trapezoid. I don't need to draw a graph or picture as long as we understand it kind of conceptually. The second trapezoid is one half. Now the height, I'm moving from two to five. So the height is going to be three. It's however far apart two and five are. So my height is three. And now my bases are four and 13. The y values at two and five. And then I move on from five to seven. So one half times two. And then my bases are 13 and 21. And then lastly, one half times one, 21 plus 23. And I would, I would leave that answer. I really would. I wouldn't add up those numbers or anything like that. That's what I would do. You'll notice what happens. So like with Riemanns, if you're doing a left Riemann, you essentially ignore the most right y value. Like that never comes into play. If you're doing a right Riemann, you don't use the most left y value. Like that's what happens. 
If you notice in trapezoids, you always use the inner ones twice. Like that four gets used in the first trapezoid and second one. The 13 gets used in both, the 21. It's the, the endpoint ones that only get used in one. You don't have to know that. That's something interesting to point out. So with Riemann sums, the question they will say is, is it an underestimation or an overestimation? And we talked about that the other day, and they're going to ask that same question with trapezoids. And they're going to ask that same question with tangent line approximation. And I told you guys, you don't want to have these rules memorized. You don't want to sit there and be like, well, since this is an increasing function and it's a left Riemann sum, it's that means I have that memorized. It's an underestimation. You don't want to have those memorized. If they ask the question, which if they do, it's probably on one question. That's why you don't want to have them memorized. If they ask the question, the advice I've given is this. I would draw, and it only really takes like 20 seconds to do this. I would draw my four pieces, like my two parabolas and split them up. Because with Riemanns, with rectangles, it was whether the function was increasing or decreasing, right? Like, like if I did a left Riemann, so I don't have the rule memorized. This is me not having the rule memorized. I'm like, okay, it's a left Riemann. How do I know if it underestimates or overestimates? Well, I do this picture and I'm like, okay, I go up, I go to the right, I go down. That went over. I go up, right, down. That was under. So with Riemanns, the concavity doesn't matter because here they're both concave up and a left was an overestimate and here a left was an underestimate. Well, let me do the same thing. Draw four left rectangles. Well, it's obviously the decreasing and increasing that matters. If a function is increasing, a left Riemann will underestimate. And I can see that if they ask the question. With trapezoids, we can do the same thing. With trapezoids, it's interesting. You would think it'd be the same, but it is not. If I draw trapezoids, and again, it doesn't matter if we start on the left or right, but if I put trapezoids under here, okay, that trapezoid is under. That trapezoid is under. It's the concavity that matters. When a function is concave down, trapezoids are always under the curve. They underestimate. When they're concave up, so go up, angle it down, trapezoids are always above the curve. I do this. I literally do not have these things memorized. So I, when I do these FRQs, I do them when they get released after you take them. I, this is what I do if the question comes up to answer the questions. You need to make sure you use the right word because I, I don't know if there's one on this test or the next test. There is a question like this on one of the next two tests. I, spoiler alert. And I don't know if it's left Riemanns, but I'll have students that'll say this. They'll say underestimate, underestimate, and they'll say, because the function is increasing and concave down. They'll use both words. They'll say it's increasing and concave down. And that's why it's an underestimate. I can't give credit for that. Because you're implying if it was increasing and concave up, it would be an overestimate. And that's not true. But that's the implication you're giving. So you have to make sure you're, you're honing in on the correct word. Is it the increasing, decreasing that matters or the concavity? All right, I want you guys to try this FRQ. I want you to try it. Let the fun begin. Such fun context, a pot of tea. It is calculator active because it's question two. So give it a shot.
someone yesterday was doing this and they said, why is there a fraction in front of the integral? When there's a fraction in front of the integral, what is that finding? What formula have we learned that we've had to do several different times when there's a fraction in front of the integral? The average value. Yeah, so anytime you guys are interpreting the meaning of something and you see a fraction in front of the integral, that's finding the average value of what's ever inside the integral. Okay. So don't let that fraction confuse you. They're just telling you it's an average value problem. Average rate of change is slow. Yeah, I do like that. All right, <clears throat> I know some of you aren't all the way done and that, that's okay. Um, but I always want you guys reading these questions so you can see the type of things that you guys are in for. And you're always gonna see patterns in the questions that come up. Like you're gonna come across all these same type of questions over and over and over again with different contexts. They'll pose the questions a little bit differently but it's the same stuff they're asking year in and year out. When it says use the data to approximate the rate at which temperature the tea is changing, so if they give you a table and they ask you to approximate the rate of something, that's the slope formula. That's the slope formula. So if you want to find the slope at 3.5, this has nothing to do with derivatives. This is slope. Here's your answer. So you're looking for, you're approximating h prime of 3.5. You don't have a function to actually find the derivative or do math eight or anything, but we can find the slope between two and five. So if we do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that's approximating the rate of h at 3.5. Someone yesterday said, can, I, can they leave the answer like this? You know, I, I've talked about how once you get to a, a certain place, just stop. You have to get to a place that's all numbers. Like if you typed it in your calculator, you'd get the right answer. So you can't stop at function notation. You can't stop here. You actually, you could stop here, you could stop at this fraction, that's fine, but you can't stop up here. Make sure you put units. Since, you're, since H is degree Celsius and you're finding the slope of that, it's derivative, that's degree Celsius per minute. Now B, when you interpret, okay. I, this is why I put that template up the other day on how we interpret. So this integral, represents the average, and then it's always the average value of whatever is inside the integral. H stands for the temperature of the T. So this integral stands for the average temperature of the T. You do have to put in degrees Celsius. If you didn't put in degrees Celsius, you don't earn the point. You also have to talk about over what time interval. So it's over the 10 minutes, T equals zero to T equals 10 minutes. The interpretation points can be easy to get, but they're some of the most missed problems because of how much you have to put in there. You got to be very careful with your words. Like, for instance, if you just put degrees, the average temperature in degrees, you don't get credit. You have to be very specific with your units. And then the trapezoidal approximation. We practice this. You're just doing the one half. Yours doesn't have to look identical to this. Questions. I we did a bunch of FRQs. This was a few years ago. 
And eventually we're doing full, full length ones. And I had a girl, it was like probably end of April. And she said, Mr. G, I haven't gotten above a three out of nine on any of these FRQs. And I said, just keep working. And she worked hard. I said, just keep working. Just keep working. Try to learn one point better. Try to learn one point better. She ended up getting a four on the AP test. Cause she just kept listening. She kept working. She didn't shut down. She didn't get frustrated. She tried the problem. It's so easy, especially at home. When I say, Hey guys, try this one. If I was at home, it'd be so easy to be like, and just get on my phone. It'd be so easy to do that. And I'll just wait till he explains it. You need to try them on your own. Just see what you're going to do right or wrong. Okay. All right. Questions on that. Okay. Couple more. We're going to end with a group grade. So you'll have to talk to each other. You guys at home too. Huh? Yeah. You're going to do this full FRQ with a group as a group grade, like a group quiz type of thing. A stink eye. Oh, man. Oh, okay. All right. We're going to do example three, though. <clears throat> and I'll work this one out kind of with you guys. So it says water is pumped into a tank at a rate of R of T gallons per minute. And I always focus on like the function they give. Is it a rate? Is it the actual gallons of the thing? Like, what are they giving me? They're giving me the rate of something, the rate at which water is being pumped into the tank. Uh, T is the number of minutes since the pump was turned on. The tank contained 800 gallons of water when the pump was turned on. How much water to the nearest gallon is in the tank after 20 minutes? This is almost the same question as the warm up, like the very first problem we did. The very first problem gave the rate at which water was going into a drain pipe. The biggest difference on the warm up, it just said how much water flowed into the pipe over that interval. This question is saying how much water is in the pipe now? Those are two different questions. When it's talking about how much water is in there now, we have to think about how much is in there initially. There's 800 gallons in there now, then the pump turns on and more water is gonna go in. Our answer has to be above 800. There's already 800 in there. So for this problem, there's already 800 in there. Here's how I would write it. There's 800 plus, there's gonna be more water that goes in. Now we have to figure out how much water actually flows in over that zero to 20 minutes. And that's what integration does for us. If we wanna figure out how much water flowed in from zero to 20, well, we integrate from zero to 20, the rate at which water is going in. So R of T dt. And it's calculator active. So once you set that up, we just math nine that bad boy. I would get in the habit of practicing entering these in the calculator so you don't actually screw something up. Someone yesterday had a TI-83 plus, And so they were asking good questions like, how, how do I enter this? They were trying to make sure they could enter things correctly. Because the 83 plus is kind of tough with parentheses and things like that. But try to enter it yourself and see if you can get Get that answer there. What do you guys think? One thing I want to talk about is something called a linkage error on the AP test. So there's a lot of students, because you grow up in math doing this, where like you do a calculation, and then you do a calculation to that number and, and so on. Here's what I mean by that. And they count this wrong. So I want, I want to make sure I explain this. I'll have a lot of students that they'll know that they need to do this integration and then they need to add 800, okay? But then this is the wrong work students show. They'll be like, okay, zero to 20, uh, R of T, DT. And then they'll say that equals 420. And then that plus 800 equals my answer. Then they get this answer. And college board says, ah, you're going to lose a point for that work. Because what they want to want is anytime you write an equal sign, 
the things on the other side of the equal sign have to in fact be equal to each other. And this thing right here is not equal to this thing right here. Those two things are not the same, yet you said they're equal. So it doesn't happen a ton, but I just thought I would point that out. That's why I write this this way, like the initial amount plus how much it changes. I, just a good habit to get into. All right, so here's what I'm gonna have you guys do. This is our last problem of the day. It's gonna be a calculator active question. And I'm gonna give you guys 15 minutes to work with the group before you have to turn it in. The reason I'm giving you 15 minutes, you get on average 15 minutes per FRQ. When you take the AP test, you get 15 minutes per problem. So you guys at home, I'm gonna put you in Zoom groups here in a second, but basically you're gonna to work together. One person in the group is gonna send me their work and everyone in the group is gonna get the same grade, okay? So you're gonna choose who you want to send the work, but everyone's gonna get the same grade on this, all right? The hope is that you all have the same answer. That doesn't matter, all right? So let me put them in Zoom groups here. And you guys at home, once you uh, finish, email it to me. Stay on, because I'll go over it once you email it to me. But um, pick one person to email me the stuff. So one, two, three, four. Oops, four, create. So four people, four people, four people. Perfect. All right, you guys are off. Work together, and you're going to pick one person to send me their work. You got 15 minutes. You can use a calculator. Off you go. You guys, so you four are going to be a group. Um, I'm going to put you two here. So you four are going to be a group. I'm going to put, uh, let's see, I'm going to have you slide over here. So you guys are going to do, oh, Oh, wait, you're already taken. Okay, so you're going to come here. You're going to be a group of three. And then you're going to come, and you're going to come here and here. And you guys can do my, That's my January. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 15 minutes. You can do it on the iPad because you guys can email it to me too. You can do it on paper also. I'm not saying no. Interesting way to, yeah. Yesterday they, they said it's probably Karen or Karen. <laughs> Oh, Parker did not go to her breakout group. Parker. Aiden, you do have to put it on because if you would test positive, then Emily is not expecting it. But if you have, but if you have, but if you have it on, then it's not. A <laughs> Parker. Um, mine never loaded. 
So I was in group three, but I never got into it. So I, I like got out of Zoom. Yeah, you you're with Caitlin. Oh, okay. There you Yeah. 
or could we just make their class larger amount so you can make it also do that? But it is wrong to put it on this whole thing. So your integral, well, since you already did like all the math up in part B, yeah, I don't think I'm going to have to do it so if I just like mental max it and then run the entire salary board, it's just yeah, just it's just if ever they say you agree on for capitalism, they want to see the things that you actually want to buy. But if they did it, it's not that bad. Thank you. Mr. G? You said add, like, no. Yeah. I said yeah. it because it made more sense generally. Say because velocity or B of T. Yeah. Um, do you want us to email it or is there like a spot to submit it or what? Just have one person email it to me. All right. I'll let you pick one, one out of the four to send me an email. You guys got two minutes. Yeah. 
I said you better read them right now when we all turn them back in. Well, when you email it to me, once everyone emails it, I'm going to go over it so you'll know. You guys have a debate? No, I think you probably just give away to the top one. No, I didn't. I didn't ask you to turn they all failed. Oh, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did show up. I got one point. Yeah. Okay. So and what did you get? I got one point three five. All right, I'm going to close their groups, then we're going to go over it. Did you find both numbers? Yeah. Then can't you just say... I think that's the closest though. Okay. But well, close enough, right? So you're off by like a quarter. So we have one point four. Wait, so one point six. If we have the right explanation, but one wrong number, even though we got it right by. Ooh, I don't know. Let me. So. Well, I'll show you the rubric and how they grade this one. Okay. I'll. I'll... Yes. It's not a huge deal. It's not a huge deal. Okay. So, from hearing, you know, obviously, you guys at home, I can't hear your conversations, but hearing the conversations in here, like, you guys have learned a lot from the first day of this year to now because there's a lot of really good things being said. And 
it's just really good improvement. So I'm going to put the rubric up so you guys can see. I'll say this. When I see a graph, I know this sounds weird, but I like imagine the scenario in my head. Like try to think about what's happening here. And I think this will help you understand the velocity stuff in general. Like from zero to one, she's like, I really want to get to school quick. And she starts going faster, faster, faster. She's like speeding up. And then it's probably right around one minute, she's like, oh, fart, I forgot my homework. And then she's still going away from home, but she's like slowing down. And I think that's really important for you to understand what's happening right here. She's still going towards school, but slower. Then at two, now this does not make sense, like physically, because she like slows down and then she like instantaneous, instantaneously is going the other direction. So I don't like how that part looks. But like, boom, that's pretty impressive. But then she's going home. She's going home from two to four. Now, four to five, understand this, from four to five, this is when she's at home, like looking for her homework for that minute. She's like ruffling through her stuff from four to five minutes. That's why her velocity is zero for a full minute. From five to 12, she's going to school. And in fact, she's like, oh crap, I've lost a lot of time. So look at what happens from like five to seven. She's like, she's like going super fast. And then at seven minutes, she's like, holy crap, I'm tired. And then she slows down a little bit for a nice, easier pace. And then she's like, okay, now I'm at school. So that's just the scenario. Do you have to think through that? No, but I think it helps like make sense of this stuff. I will put the, the answers up. So um, the acceleration, is the slope of velocity. You do need correct units. Guys, units should be the easiest points ever gotten on your AP test. If you are finding position, your units are miles. If you're finding velocity, it's miles per minute or whatever the units are. If it's acceleration, it's miles per minute squared. That goes even for other contexts. Like, you know, I talked about, um, the you know the rate of bananas being stocked i've talked about that like it would be bananas and then it would be bananas per minute and then it would be bananas per minute squared like it always goes like the thing the thing per time and the thing per time squared always there's nothing else that will ever happen one of those three so those should be the easiest points gotten um b so b is first of all you have to understand is total distance traveled but if you just wrote, it's the total distance she traveled, you don't get credit for that for two reasons. I was talking to Steven about this. For two reasons, you have to include the units of her distance, so you have to say in miles, and then you also have to include minutes. So from t equals zero to t equals 12 minutes. Make sure you put units on the thing and units on the time. You do not need to put these like integrals here. The rubric does, you don't need to put that. If you put these values, basically whatever you did to get to 1.8, you're in good shape. As long as you're showing how you got to 1.8, you're fine. Just make sure you do the correct math. Um, she turns around at t equals two, and that's because her velocity changes from positive to negative. Please don't say because it changes from positive to negative. Please don't say because the graph changes from positive to negative. Be specific and name your function. Velocity changes from positive to negative. Then Larry comes along and there's a couple ways you can answer this question. First of all, in here, I saw a lot of you guys got 1.6 because you're just integrating Larry's rate from zero to 12. He lives 1.6 miles from school. There's a lot of debate between you guys on Karen. You can do this one of two ways. You can either say her integral from zero to 12 is 1.4. Someone yesterday said, could we just do from five to 12? They said, can we write the integral from five to 12? I said, yeah, that's fine. Because think about what's happening. She's at home at five. She gets to school at 12. So whatever this area from five to 12 is, that's her, her uh, distance from school. So you asked about how would that get scored? Emily said, well, we got the wrong Karen value, but we you know, drew the right conclusion. Well, if you look at the points on this rubric, they kind of uh, had that not matter. So you would get a point for Larry's integral. You'd get a point for math nining that correctly. You would not earn that final point. 
So you get two out of three on part D if you had Karen's value wrong. Um, how'd they get 1.4? Whatever, you guys were doing the right thing. It's just however you guys did the areas, I don't know. I would do five to 12. Yeah, can I do the areas? So it'd be one half times one times 0.3. So is that 0.15? Is that what that is? That's 0.15. That is 0.3. That is one times 0.2, so 0.2. Uh, this is one, two, three times 0.2. What's that, 0.6? All that's 0.6. Uh, this is 0.1. And this little itty bitty triangle up here is one half times one times 0 0.1, 0.05. So I would get, I don't know if this is right. What's that? 0 0.7, 0 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4. Yeah, that works. Um, okay, so your homework tonight, guys, is super short. I cut it, guys, three questions, and it's not like each one's part A, B, C, D, E, F. Like, it's three pretty succinct problems that it's not going to take you very long. The uh, review guide is on Canvas for your extra credit for your test. And then next class, we have a lot of really good re uh, review problems to do, too. I am going to have you guys sign on. I haven't decided if I'm going to keep you on. I want to because... Part of me is like, well, if they sign off, I can't guarantee they're doing the problems or hearing my explanations. And then I feel like a bad teacher. Wait, so, test on so your test is on Friday. Thursday, yeah, your guys Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Friday. Yeah. All right, you guys at home are free to go. Have a great weekend. Stay classy. Yes. So is all you got wrong was Karen's distance from school? No, we got B one. Well, B one didn't actually calculate. We just left it in the test. Oh, but it didn't work out. So it just well for that either that or you just type it in. For B one, you don't have to do it. Yeah, because it's her total distance from zero to twelve. Are you even gonna agree? I'm mean, just gonna give everyone full credit. <laughs> it's fine. Just from hearing like really good conversation, that's what I'm after. That's what I want. <laughs> Everybody's the same. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>